So Mark, Peyton, uh, I, I'm going to start uh, with with a fun fact. Mark was the first person in Hollywood who uh, actually gave me a job directing a feature, my first movie, Bring It On, uh, which Mark produced. So I want to thank you for that right off the bat. Um, and I remember, uh, it seems it was maybe five years ago that I ran into you and said, you know, what are you up to? And you mentioned Hank Williams to me. I don't know if you were reading the book or had started writing it, but I wanted to sort of find out how that first came on your radar. Um, before I say that, I just want to say th this is how good a guy Peyton Reed is. Besides the fact that we did bring it on again, he went to the University of North Carolina. They're playing right now. <laughs> right now. And I went to University of Virginia. This is kind of how goofy I am. I went to the University of Virginia, and they're just finishing that, that, that game. So all we've been doing is avoiding our text and, and keeping our ears stuck on that. This is why so we have really DVRs. nice of him to. I can't believe it on Easter and all you guys coming out. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I really do. It's a great honor to be at the Director's Guild talk about it. Um, well, actually, I was a lifelong sort of country music fan. I've always loved country music, and I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, which is three hours north of Nashville. And um, I uh, used to listen to, you know, the radio going to bed at night, and although Hank preceded me, which... I hope it's an obvious thing, but in any, I hope. But in any case, I did listen to George Jones and Merle and then, you know, Willie and then Chris Christopherson. And I had come, become, uh, when you do that, you become familiar with Hank Williams because he's influenced them all. They talk about it. The DJs always play a Hank song somewhere in a set. And that's why how I got interested in, in Hank. And, um, and then what happened is somebody actually started talking about, I started hearing out there are like crumbs of people saying that someone was going to do a Hank Williams movie. And I got really jealous about that concept. And I just said, no, but I should do that. I should do that. And I finally sat down. And that's when we were talking and, and wrote the script because I didn't know what else to do. So you found, had you, at that point, you found the book. Well, no, actually what, <laughs> not to contradict you, but what actually happened is um, I, I started reading a lot of books. Chet Flippo had written a book, and there's about 30 different books written about Hank. There's a really, really good one out recently called The Hank Williams Reader. But there was a ton of books. There was a lot of stuff on the Internet, you know, which, of course, in the old days we had gone to the library to get, but it was just available to me. I read, I read all this different stuff, and then I came across Colin's book. And then slowly everything else kind of went to the wayside, and I just started using that book. But I wrote the script without actually having the rights to the book. And then I, but I felt, honestly, that Colin had done such a great job, and it was such a good piece of material, and I had relied on it so much that the right thing to do was to get in touch with him about it. Right. And then I went to, to Nashville, and I showed him my book, which looked like, you know, I don't know, it, it was all tattered and dog-eared, and I said, I, this, and he, and, and he graciously said, sure, you can, you can base it on that book. So you tackled, I think, at least a couple of the hardest things you can possibly do as a director, which is to to dive into someone's actual real life story, and then also someone who is a singer and a really well known singer. Uh, so I want to sort of leap to the to the casting thing because that must have been maybe long before you thought of Tom Hiddleston as you were writing this thing. Yeah, that had to have been this daunting thing hanging out there about okay, I'm going to write this thing, uh, hopefully I'll get it financed, and then I have to find someone who can, you know, look the part, act the part, and hopefully sing the part. Uh, did you have, how did that process start for you, or how early did it start? Well, I, I think I just knew better than to start worrying about it too early. And then when I finished the script, I kind of got it out there, and, it was, and I started meeting with a lot of the young actors, and, and they all wanted to meet. And I don't know, if I'm not necessarily saying because the script was so great, but they, they wanted to meet because they knew it was a meaty part. It was so juicy. Um, and I, I couldn't, and I kept telling everybody from the beginning, because I always said I'm never going to lip sync the movie. And maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. But for me, I, and I, there's been some great movies that have done that, so it's not like that can't be done. But for me, it's always been a little bit of taking me out of the film. 
So that didn't daunt any of the actors at the time. I don't know if they could have pulled it off, <laughs> but they were all like, yeah, I can sing, I can sing. They all told me they could sing. Every one of them said that. Every single one said, I can sing. And by the way, all told me they could play the guitar. And I never tried it out, but that's what they said. So, and then I was at the uh, premiere for War Horse. And um, I was sitting next to my, one of my former wives. And <laughs> Peyton knows this. And um, in the middle of it, I see Hiddleston. And I didn't know who he was or anything, but he was really dynamic in the movie. And, and I, but I kept thinking, hey, he looks so much like Hank Williams. So I, I leaned over and I nudged Janie and I said, that guy looks a lot like Hank Williams. And she went, does everything in our life have to get right back to Hank Williams? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I sent him the script. I got to his agent and I sent him the script and he loved it and we Skyped and um, he was really, really personable and magnetic and he was in his place in London and he, you know, said he could play the guitar and, and Tom's got a lot of pork in him so he, he didn't shy about playing and he got that guitar out and we talked and then um, eventually we met and I just had this overwhelming feeling when we met Denise Champion who I'm sure some of y'all know is a wonderful casting agent and, and, and Denise had made me swear because I'm really spontaneous and I have a tendency sometimes to do things without thinking too far but when it comes to casting that's how I like to do it and I kind of said she said, swear to me, you will not cast anybody as Hank unless they read and you get them to sing. And I went, okay, I, I promise, I promise. And the first meeting we had in person at dinner at the restaurant and two bottles of wine later, I said, will you do the part? And I had no money in, uh, at that point. I had nothing. And I just said to him, if he, and he didn't believe me. He said, well, but I want to prepare. And I said, no, no, I'm saying we'll do it together. If you'll stick with me, I'll stick with you. And Thor hadn't come out. And he plays Loki in the Avengers movies. And he, I mean, he sounds like the king of England when you actually hear him talk. I mean, he's got the, you know, beautiful English accent, legitimate one. And um, so I, I, at that point, am I going on too long about no. this? He said... It, that, neither one of those song, movies had come out. So then I told Denise, and she was like, oh, my gosh, okay, but he is really talented, okay. And then my friends would say to me, well, who did you cast? And I said, this guy, Tom Hiddleston. And they were like, well, who's Tom Hiddleston? And then Thor comes out, and people went, well, why'd you cast Tom Hiddleston? And then Avengers comes out, and I'm in a restaurant, and people are saying, Hey man, how'd you get Tom Hiddleston? <laughs> so that's kind that's of the... yeah, that's that's a typical Hollywood thing. I mean, I, I, he's such a talented actor. I he played uh, uh, Scott Fitzgerald in the Woody Allen movie Midnight in Paris, which yes. is a really small role. But that also struck me like, oh wow, who is that guy? Yeah, he's just got such presence and charisma. And I also grew up in the South. I grew up in North Carolina, so I'm a real stickler. <laughs> for Southern accents in movies, and I, I was really, really impressed with his accent. His whole countenance was Southern to me. He, he works so hard on it. I mean, that's the job. It's, you know, I told him, he kept, when he would tell me how hard he worked, I said, you know, my father always said, don't tell me how hard you can work, son. A mule can outwork a man. But nevertheless, he did work. He did work really hard. And... um and he lived with this guy, Rodney Crowell. And Rodney Crowell is a, is a kind of a, a venerated singer-songwriter who tours with uh, Emmy Lou, and they've won two Grammys. And his, this is goes how far Rodney goes. His father-in-law was Johnny Cash, which is, I think, the, it's hard for me to kind of even imagine. And, and he lived, and Tom lived with Rodney for uh, two months at Rodney's house. Oh, wow. Which... I kept saying, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't live at somebody's house. Live in the hotel and go. He said, no, I want to submerge myself. And he did do that. And he also, you know, he got a, obviously got a dialect coach. And his, I love his script because one page is the, is the script and the other is the whole phonetic Alabama. And because Alabama is different than North Carolina, yeah. as we all know. And I'm from Kentucky and Tennessee is different. And 
Texas, and you know they're all slightly different. He was a stickler, so I love that you. He would I, oh, yeah. when I tell him you said that, he'll. No, um, really, really yeah. amazing, and because it's you know sometimes that can just sink a character, especially you know Hank Williams. I yeah. Mean, you, you, and then the singing again. I want to talk to you about the process. Were there pre-records, or he you did it live, and he he did the stuff, or how did it? How did it work? Well, we couldn't do it. I didn't have the, the, the dough for, for starters to put, to bring in a big recording thing and do it all 100% live because, you know, and so as you know as well as I do, and so do you all, you all that you got to cut. So you got to, so we did, what we did is we, all those tracks, I love those tracks. At the end, you know, that harmonica and the, I'm so lonesome. I was just telling Peyton, that's Mickey Raphael from Willie's band, you know, one of the great harp players of all time. But we recorded all our tracks. Rodney did that. He got the best players in Nashville. And we recorded all that in the round, just like Hank's stuff. And then with Tom, we recorded all the stuff live, as live as we could get it. And then he sang to his own playback, except in a couple situations, like when they're singing to the baby. Uh, I saw the light. That was all live. And in Your Cheating Heart. That was that's him, you know, and everything else I I had to pre-record because I wouldn't have been able to cut it. But uh, the thing is, he's uh, he's so crazy because and it was great for me because we were it was cold in Shreveport and and when we were doing a lot of this stuff, and he would just play the whole repertoire in between you know in between takes and keep all the people you know all juiced up because they they were like this and then he'd start playing, you know. Hey, good looking, or John Belay, or something. All right, so I have to ask you just one more writing question. As you were starting to write the story, um, and and deciding on what aspect of his life to focus on, the movie really focuses on Audrey and Hank a lot. And you opened the door when you mentioned your multiple ex wives. <laughs> uh, but it, how did? It, but that really is like a, a part of the movie. Is really it's it's all about this relationship that has a a pretty high level of dysfunction going on. How early on did you land on that aspect of his story? You know, it was, and, it, and I've had a lot of people come at me different reasons for that, but I made a decision about the, the way I wanted to tell the story based on certain things I didn't want to do as much as what I did want to do. I never wanted to tell the story from the cradle to the grave because I felt like I knew everything about Hank. I mean, very few people outside of maybe Colin, know more than I know about Hank right now. I mean, I really know a lot about the guy, so I knew his whole history. But I've always felt like a, that there's an element of trying to uh, explain this genius through something that happened as a child. And he was taught how to play the guitar by a great, Af uh, not a great, but a good African-American singer. But that was not interesting to me because I felt like we could all assume that he got he had to learn that stuff. And I didn't want to analyze how he how he became Hank because I can't. I personally don't believe that's possible. I always said to people when they would say, and I was talking to people when I was raising money. I said, "Well, do you want to explain him a little?" More? I said, "Well, if you can explain how Bob Zimmerman from Hibbing, Minnesota, whose dad runs a furniture store, becomes Bob Dylan, I'll explain Hank Williams." Because I couldn't get, so I avoided that. So to me, the thing that I felt people really didn't understand and really didn't know that much about and really believe and am always interested in is the, is the human condition and the relationships between the people in your life, a man, woman, whatever, whoever's the artist, whoever's the filmmaker, whoever was, whatever one may do, is so significantly influenced by those relationships or that lack thereof. And so I for better or worse, determined that I wanted to show, because every person I talked to that was still knew anything about Hank and every piece of information I got about Hank was that Audrey had a, that their tumultuous relationship was a lot of the coal that started to fire for him to write what he wrote. And it's, it's hard to imagine a man writing in anger, unkind words are said that make the teardrop start. How can I free your doubtful mind and melt your cold, cold heart? Because he has such a great relationship. Right. So I just dug into that. And, and also, I guess maybe I related to the fact that he did have a lot of women in his life and they did have this great influence on him. And I just found that to be, the, for me, trust the audience that if they see this fire, they don't need to see him with it 
pencil or a typewriter writing a song, they they'll make the connection. But that's a kind of how I approached it. And Elizabeth Olsen is fantastic right. in the movie. I think she's an amazing actress all around, but really great. And I, I think I mentioned to you earlier, there's something about her in this movie that reminds me of a really young Patricia Neal. Like I think of maybe in Face in the Crowd or something like that. But she's or really... Hud maybe. She, yeah. She's really steely and, and, and she felt very Southern to me as well in this. Really amazing. I... I, I when I watch the movie, I, I, I'm blown away by both of them. And... And a lot of the actors are so, I, you know, for me, that's the most enjoyable part and the most challenging and the most frustrating part is the actors, but probably the same for a lot of you all. But um, the thing about Elizabeth that I felt when I first met her, she's a pretty fierce woman. And she's only 26 years old, but she is... I always said to her when I'd see her come, I'd go, oh, the Liz Bird's coming. Oh, man, you know. Um... And Tom and I would kind of go, you know, we, we were both a little scared of her. But but um, the thing that she, the, the character, Audrey was really, you know, first of all, you've got a very formidable woman at a time when a lot of women, you know, people weren't interested in that in, in a woman. That's number one. Number two, there's a history of women in certain bands. I mean, she was kind of Yoko Ono to the band. You know, she wanted to sing. Hank always said, it's hell having a wife who wants to sing, but it's really hell having one who wants to sing and can't. Um, but, um, you know, the thing that I think, because she could be construed as a shrew or really bitchy, the thing that I felt when I met Elizabeth and we talked and she was so articulate about the character was she has a real intelligence in her face, which I, I think, you know, the Patricia Neal thing is really an interesting analogy or comparison. And it's so much intelligence that I think what she conveys, even though she's so rough, is a little bit of like, okay, yeah, I can be kind of, you know, difficult, but how would you like to be married to this guy? And And I think that is such an important quality that she was able to convey in a very, very subtle way that, even in the last phone call when she hangs up on him and the way she says, hun, you know, she's, it's, it's cruel. You know, I got to go. We'll see you later, hun. And it's just like, ooh, you know, there's something about that. She, the smallest things to me anyway. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I thought the casting just all around was terrific. I had one, I'd asked you, uh, the woman who plays Bobby, Ren Schmidt. I don't think I'd ever seen her in anything. I thought she was really, really terrific. Yeah. And there's a scene where, they're sitting on the the dock, talking about you know you know he's saying like I love you but I don't love you like that and you play it all in one master which I thought was terrific I thought they're really great in that scene. Well, uh, thanks, man, because it is one of my favorite scenes because they're just there and I I was telling Peyton we a little bit but we didn't have much time to talk about but I, he said he said to me before it came out I really liked that scene and. It, coming from a director and such a good one and a friend, you know, I know he ain't prone to just say that, you know. Um, so the thing about it is Dante, which we probably want to talk, Dante has been only shot the movie who I love and who is hilarious and a great artist, you know. He he kept bugging me, because I, I didn't get behind the monitor, I was only about this far from him, but they were so emotional and it was so good. I, I just said, we got it. And and Dante was on me about to, Dante was with Monarch, we got to go with the coverage, you're going to need the coverage. And I said, but Dante, I love it, I'm, I don't want, you know, and we are so respectful of each other, we never, when we argue, but we would never fight. And I went, I'm, 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 I'll never use it. They're that good, oh, Monarch, come on, she's beautiful, let me photograph her, for God's sakes, what are you doing, let me do this, for God, let me shoot the woman. So we shot both of them, and it was really good. Of course it was beautiful, because she's great. And Ren is, uh, um, Reed, uh, Peyton was asking me about Ren, and she's done a lot of television. She's a wonderful actress. So then Dante bets me, which goes to show you one of the worst bets in the world. He bets me I'll use the coverage. He says, I'll bet you I'll, you'll use the coverage in, in, for the, the best restaurant in L.A. And I go, Dante, I'm going to cut the movie. What a stupid bet. But uh, I didn't, and you appreciated it. I mean, Dante and I, just to tell you a funny story, about the first movie that I ever did, which, you know, I, one might challenge my commercial taste, was about the guy invented the intermittent windshield wiper. 
So I made a movie about a guy who invents a windshield wiper. But Greg Kinnear, he was great in the movie. But I was blocking a scene once, and I felt really confident about how I blocked the scene. And Dante would smoke these little cheroots, the wor- the kind of terrible cigars you would buy at CVS. I mean, it was seriously, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have a dog smoke them. And it, and because you can't smoke on says, we all know he's over in the window. And, I, and the whole crew's in front of him, and I finished with my brilliant diatribe about why this scene's going to be perfectly shot, and everything's going to be great, and then, and the crew's all going like, yeah, Mark, that's great. And, everything. and I'm looking, and I said, where's Dante? And they go, and he's over, and he says, he's over by the window, blowing the smoke out the window. So I, 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 I shout out, I go, Dante, did you hear what I said? Yes, Mark, I heard. I said, sound, what, it sounds good, what do you think? Yes, Mark, we do something like that, maybe a little better. Now you had known him for a long. Had you you'd produced movies that he'd shot as well, or you have a long term relationship, or did you first meet on on your first film? No, um, I, uh, another really nice thing. I mean, uh, you know, I to digress a second. I love the fact that I'm sitting here with Peyton, and he was so generous and asked me when I asked him to to do this because, you know, you we always are told about Hollywood being a certain way that people, that people that don't know about it, that there's not a lot of loyalty or great stories. And the fact that I, I had met him when he directed his first picture, and now here we are doing this is wonderful. But I met Dante. He's when, not mentioning the $1,000 he paid me to be yeah. here today. He, that's, well, that's not very that nice. much, really. Very nice. I'm going to get Sony Classics to pay. The fact is, Sony Classics... That I had, they're so cheap. I had an argument over a thirty-four dollar rental car in Nashville, and I'm not kidding. Tom Bernard, I like him a lot, and he loved the movie, but he argued thirty-four dollars. I sent him a text of the picture, of the thirty-four bucks. He said, "What? I take cabs. Why can't you take a cab?" I said, "It's cheaper if I rent the car, for God's sakes." But um, I met Dante when he shot a movie called The Family Man with Nick Cage and Taylor Leone that I had developed and produced that Brett Ratner, who put up half the money with this crazy company. He's got Rat back for the movie. So a lot of people kind of looking after each other through a long time, really. Um, that's when I met Dante, and, you know, I was always thought he was great. And when I decided to do Flash of Genius, I asked him if he would do it, and he said, yeah. He He's did. an amazing photographer. Yeah, he did a beautiful so you, job. so I have to ask you too, since you you started as a producer and and are now directing, do you ever find yourself producing yourself uh, as the director? I mean, because I, I I don't know how much the movie costs, but you know it looks fantastic. But do you how, how much of that producer well, brain of yours is working? I, I mean, it's so funny, you know. It does, it's not a lot of people have done that. Gone, um, but of course I've studied all of them who did like the great ones i'm not saying i'm that but like alan pakula and and it's funny whenever the press write about me as a, because they never fail to mention that i was had produced but the the way they write about it instead of using the word producer they might as well just write it pedophile <laughs> it's crazy they do it's just so it's so disparaging about they, they go like mark abraham formerly known as a producer ex slash pedophile um, so, you know, I'm a pragmatic guy. I always have been, you know, and as you know how we work together, you know, my job as a producer was to have the best relationship I could with the director and be there as much as I could. And I've always said, when people ask me about producing, I said, a director cares as much. No one cares more than a director about a movie. No one cares as much. You just have to do, you have to try to care as much as they do and you'll get their respect. The minute a director feels like you actually don't care as much, that you're just glad to show up, get your picture taken, go on, be on the phone, and be the next one. I said, they're never going to have that same regard. This movie, and I'm really proud of what we did it for. We, I mean, it's not an, it's an independent film. We did it independently. We didn't have anything. We made it for about $12.5 million, which is not an insignificant, insignificant amount. But for an independent film that had, we shot... 57 locations, we shot 39 days, and we shot 132 scenes. And it's a period film. And it's a period film. So I was one of the producers of it, and I didn't want to be, but I knew more than the rest of the guys who were producing the movie, so I had to. And so my attitude about it was, 
kill the producer when it's anything that is a creative, really important creative decision. Do not be a producer. Just kill them, you know, and 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 leave them in the in the dirt. But when it's about trying to make things, give yourself the most opportunity to get done what you need to do, then inject yourself that way. So be a problem solver instead of, you know, problem creator. Uh, and it's, a, I don't think it's that hard. It's just being decent, really, yeah, for the most part, and being respectful of the money. And how do you, I, I want to know sort of, because I've never been on set when you're directing, and I want to kind of know <laughs> how, what your style is, uh, at, you know, how you, uh, do you rehearse? Did you have rehearsal time on this movie? How you work with your ads? How you know? Are you a screamer? Do you have a really <laughs> bad attitude on set? Are you calm? I'm really I'm fascinated. I I've never raised my voice on a movie, and my attitude about it is I always give a speech. I gave a speech sometimes when I was a producer, but in the movies that I've directed, I give a speech, and I always say we're all the same. I believe that we know what it takes to make a movie. It, it I said there's no question that yes, I will ultimately have the say. I don't, I am very sensitive when people have beefs with each other. I can be sitting there and somebody walks past me and, I'll, and, and, I, and a lot of us are like that because that's, our, we're about learning about people and I, I'll go, what's wrong? Because I'll smell it. And I say, I always say, look, if you got a beef with somebody on the thing, I want you to talk it out. If you can't work it out together, I want you to come to me and I'll referee it. But I don't want people walking around with a big chip on their shoulder. So let's start with that. And then I said, as far as how important everybody is, and this isn't like genius stuff, I just said, but let's be honest. There's going to come a moment when the most important person on this movie set is a person who can get that 49 Ford to run. Because we're all going to be sitting around waiting on it. And I, nothing I can do, and nothing the AD can do, and nothing Dante can do, and nothing the producer can do. It's that man whose job it is to be, and he's going to feel the pressure, and we got to support that. I, I, my way of sort of, first of all, I love working with the actors, and I, I, but I never raise my voice. I love the collaboration. I like to know everybody's name, and everybody knows me, and we are all open. If I do get upset about something, I, I have found the most effective way to do it is to make somebody feel bad <laughs> by calling them aside later and say, come over to my, call, like the principal's office, and just say, come to my thing. And make them sweat a little bit if they've acted badly or not really come through the way they promised. And I didn't have to do it very often. But if they've promised and then let, some, let the team down, I usually let them know a few hours before I say we're a rat so they could sweat it. Because my dad used to do that to me, and it was horrible. Whenever I would screw up and I knew that I screwed up, he'd sit through dinner and he wouldn't say a word. And I'd just be waiting for him to drop the hammer. And then finally, about, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes after dinner, he'd say, meet me in my in the living room. <laughs> so I'd say, come to my trailer. And then I'd say, look, you gave me your word. You told everybody else you were going to handle this. What happened? Because you let a lot of people down. And I find that most people really feel bad about that. And they don't want to. And nobody wants to be shouted. I never would. As a producer, too, I never let him. You know that. I, it's I'm, a very southern way of running a set. <laughs> it is. It's like a southern father, the way the southern father does. <laughs> There's a certain amount of shame involved. <laughs> well, that that works pretty good. Yeah. Um, this, it's interesting you talked about, like, you know, if people are fighting on the set. Uh, I definitely like to have a calm set, but there's a Fellini quote, I'm going to misquote it, but where he talks about, like, you know, if he looks around the stage and there's, like, one you know, glowering face, one face that's not into it, it just completely throws him and he has to walk away because it's such a sacred place when you're on a set. You know, you, you want to know, particularly as the director, you want to know that you are supported and everybody is is fighting for the same thing. And if you get that one yeah. face or those two people who are, they feel like, wait, what's going on over here? It's It can be so disruptive. It, it takes your mind off your business, which is a bad thing. It's like texting while you're driving. It's a bad idea. So, you By know, the way, I'm not checking my Twitter feed or texting. These are my questions. I know you're not because technology. we don't want to know what the Tar Heels are doing. No, I, I went can't to check Virginia. He went to North Carolina. And when I was at school, which was obviously before he was, they, we all, did I ever tell you what they used to say about that? They used to say, I'd rather have shit on my heel than tar. <laughs> 
I could tell you the many things that we said about Virginia, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that to you in public on Easter Sunday. I'm not going to do that. I shouldn't have done it on You're Easter not gonna Sunday. Do that at You're all. right. That's actually, I feel bad about that now. Um, but yeah, I wanted I wanted to also just talk about sort of the your preparation and the way you prep for something like right. this. Um, you know, do you sit with uh, with Dante, or do you go through the script and talk about? Do you do shot lists, or do you board stuff out, or you just kind of go and watch rehearsal, or how do you like to work? Well, with the actors, I did have. We didn't. I don't like. I, I don't like to rehearse the scenes that much, but I love to spend the time with them. And so, so with Tom and Lizzie and then Ren and everybody, I always made time to sit down and we would always have dinner or we'd go over to my place and we'd sit and talk. And then we might run a little bit about the scene, but we really would get our head wrapped around it. I mean, Bradley Whitford, I don't know if you all know, you know he plays Fred Rose. If any of you have worked with Bradley, he's a demented individual, just so you know. He's hilarious, but he is I, I, truly demented and he he couldn't believe it because he showed up he didn't you know he only worked about seven eight days we had to scram it all together and when he showed up in Shreveport he, he got in and I said well you're working tomorrow or the next day and I said we we got to talk and he you know he's done the West Wing I mean this a guy that you know it's not like it ain't his first barbecue so he knew what he was doing but I said, no, no, I really like for everybody to know each other because then it's just not like, hey, his own so And he said, oh, okay, well, tom you know, tomorrow. I said, no. <laughs> and so Tom's the star. He's number one on the call sheet. And I said, and I'd already gotten to Hiddleston. I said, I, let's go see Whitford at his hotel room. And he, he was like, what? Because he, he said, well, I'll come to you. And I said, no, 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 just stay in your hotel room, and Tom and I will be over in an hour. Just get a bottle of wine. He couldn't believe it, that it's so va uh, so valuable. Um, in terms of my preparation, I really, really like to be prepared. A movie like this, I didn't board much because, you know, when the movie, I mean, I don't even know how Peyton did his movie. I mean, I, all the green screen, the scale, I couldn't even, that's such an overwhelming idea to me. And you would have to, <clears throat> I guess, do more of it, but I didn't board much. Uh, the only thing I, what I do do that I really enjoy doing, and because I love Dante so much, is I Dante and my first AD, John McEwen, who's a great guy, uh, wonderful. I saw him last night. He came to a screening, I mean, to a, a, the movie theater. Um, we went through the movie twice together in two days. Uh, we took every scene, and we had already tech scouted it, so we knew exactly what the location was going to be for the most part. You know, some of them weren't built, but we knew basically the geography. And we went through each scene, and I talked about how I thought the scene should come down, and then Johnny would just kind of make sure, okay, and then he would start, you know, saying, what do you think, beside, over and above the tech scout, what do you think you need? And then Dante would say, get it in his head, and then... The second time we went through, we went through much faster. But that took, that probably took a day and a half of just every scene. And then the next day we went through it and we put a time for how long we thought it would, would shoot. Now, it didn't always end up how much time. Got to start somewhere, though. But we started <laughs> yeah. with, so we sort of knew how much we wanted to. So at least when I was going through it, I had in my mind that we had allocated three hours for this scene. And Dante had in his mind, and by the way, I mean, Dante pulled in two of the greatest camera operators, had Henry Terrell on the Steadicam and Dwayne Manweiler, who is a monster camera operator. I mean, just about, you know, he shot, he carried the camera on all of Michael Mann's movies, and you know how Michael is. He just puts 180 on there and just tells them to go until they fall, drop dead, and then he's, you know, and, and, and that's how, and Dwayne was, you know, I mean, having those guys, you know, but that's how I do it. And then I, I, so I have in my head what to get done. Maybe that is a little prodisorial, but it, it helps me creatively a lot because I can take a little bit of that um, anxiety out of it. Yeah, I think it's, it's a crucial thing because it does allow you, it frees up your creative thing yeah. on the day. Um, listen, I think the movie's terrific. I was talking to my mom uh, who is in her 80s and a huge Hank Williams fan. And it's the songs are so amazing. I mean, they're just, they, they are, I, cause I didn't get into Hank Williams until the early eighties 
And it was weirdly through Elvis Costello had done a cover of uh, Why Don't You Love Me Like You Used to Do. Yeah. And then there was a band called Jason and the Nashville Scorchers who did I'm So Lonesome Hank I Could Cry. songs, by the way. But, they, uh, but I, I then was like, well, who is this Hank Williams guy? And there was a CD that came out in the late 80s or early 90s. There was like a two CD set of 40 songs, all the great Hank Williams stuff. And that's when it was like, oh, wow. Yeah. And it wasn't until later that I realized that he did not make it out of his 20s. Um, but the yeah. songs are just, you know, they are amazing songs. They just last. They stand the test of time, no matter who sings them. But when you hear his voice, and Hiddleston just knocked it out of the park. Well, I, you know, I told Tom, you'll never, like I said, you'll never sound like Hank exactly. Let's don't worry about that. Let's just get close enough. To, it's you're, you're an actor. Let's get close enough to the performance, and the audience will give you cut you the slack if, if because the songs are so good and the tracks are so good, and your voice is really good. He's got a beautiful voice. Let's just try to keep it as visceral as we possibly can. But you're right. I mean, and you all obviously are, you know, know about Hank or fans or wanted to know, um, or got kicked out of the house on Easter, but. Um, <laughs> But the the thing is, you know, if you listen to Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan doesn't give it up to everybody. Bob Dylan, um, Bruce Springsteen, um, Leonard Cohen, right? You know, mentions him in a song. Um, Keith Richards, you know, I mean, uh, Tom Petty, Kurt Cobain, Beck. I, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, um, Cheryl Crow, uh, Patsy Cline, Lucinda Williams. I mean, they all talk about Hank Williams every one of them and you know I don't think I realized until halfway through the movie that there was a moment when I was like oh my god I'm making a movie about Hank Williams I'm going to have a lot of people on my ass but um yeah I mean he's a he's a seminal seminal literary figure of the 20th century his poetry is is men in 1953 52 when Bing Crosby was big and when other people were not singing songs or writing things that said, I'm so lonesome I could cry, they weren't talking about crying. And and he, for some reason, was able to be that vulnerable. Yeah, it's kind of the dawn of personal songwriting yeah, that you know, yeah, in the 60s exactly. Brian Wilson took up and all those people. That's but, exactly right. Um, congratulations thank on you. the movie, Mark. And, thank you, buddy. Uh, thank you all for coming thank out. Thank you all so Terrific. much. Terrific. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you. Now we can rush home, man, and just not turn on the radio. And <laughs>